this evening, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the major issues in public health, uh, both now and historically, uh, and that is air pollution. But I'm going to concentrate in particular on potential solutions uh, rather than just laying out for 50 minutes the grisly facts of what goes wrong. Although I will do a little bit of that at the beginning. Now, as everybody knows, pollutants can get into us by several uh, routes, but really only three have got public health importance because they're three organs with very large surface areas facing the environment in different ways. Uh, the lung, which is what I'm going to talk about today, air pollution, the gut, uh, food and water, and historically, uh, air pollu pollution by that route, uh, particularly by water, was a very serious issue uh, in the UK, still is a very serious issue in many parts of the world, uh, and the skin, which is the least important because it's a fairly impervious barrier. This is uh, one of the early uh, major public health campaigns in the UK about trying to clean up the Thames, for example. People often think of pollution as a modern problem, but actually it's an extremely old one, and air pollution, which we're talking about today, predates Gresham College and remains common today everywhere in the world. Much of it, uh, again, in contrast to what a lot of people imagine, is actually indoor air pollution. And I've just illustrated two uh, areas where it's pretty obvious where it's coming from. Uh, this lady in Uganda, uh, is exposing herself to very harmful levels of pollution from her cooking. Uh, and this, for example, is the Hampton Court kitchens, where you can see the remains of where the pollution uh, was at the point when it was being used as the cooking range here. So this is something which happened whether you were rich or poor, uh, and uh, still happens around the world. London's preeminence as a city, and as a global city, and for many many. Uh, decades it was the global city, um, uh, came at a significant cost in terms of air pollution. Although it has to be said it was also a great boon for art. Uh, I've given two examples here, one from the written and one from the visual arts. Uh, the love song of Alfred J. Prufrock, which starts off with a brilliant description of, of a, a smog. Uh, and on the right, uh, one of Monet's uh, paintings. The reason he liked London so much was because of the fantastic uh, light that the air pollution gave. And you can see a good uh, example here. Attempts to address pollution are also not new. So this is not a new and faddish issue. Uh, the first one that uh, we're aware of uh, that was obvious in, London, in the UK uh, was King Edward I, who in 1272 tried to burn, uh, ban the use of sea coal, that was coal brought down from Newcastle, uh, in London. Uh, and there were multiple attempts by industries to clean up their act at various points, usually when they were threatened by the law, uh, and many major thinkers gave a lot of thought as to how best to do this. Here, for example, is John Evelyn, best known as a diarist, but also a, a great man of science and letters of his day, uh, a, uh, a major pamphlet he wrote, uh, which talked about the inconvenience of the air and smoke of London and what we should do about it, arguing in particular, for example, for moving polluting industries like lime burning away from areas of population. Uh, interestingly, this particular uh, bit of work uh, appears in the Ballad of Gresham College, uh, a rather less distinguished poem than uh, T.S. Eliot's, it has to be said, but one that does actually explain uh, the importance of Gresham to science uh, and thinking in that period. Uh, shows that the sea coal, sea coal smoke that always lundeth in Varan and so on. I'm not going to go through it because, as I say, it, it's less good poetically than uh, we might hope as members of the college. In the recent uh, past, the biggest spur to UK action was, in fact, uh, the Great Smog of 1952. A few of you here uh, will have been alive uh, and even, may even remember it. Um, it was a combination of cold uh, air and atmospheric conditions uh, in an era when much of the heating was by coal uh, or, in some cases, by wood, but particularly by coal. Uh, and over a period of three days, at least 4,000 people died uh, some people estimate it was up to 12,000 people, uh, and uh, around 100,000 were made un unwell over this period uh, of uh, severe smog. And it led, despite some significant uh, concerns by the government of the day of the economic uh, impacts of this, uh, to the Clean Air Act of 1956, the first of several major acts, but one that actually started the process 
uh, in more recent era of cleaning up uh, the air of major cities. And this kind of uh, effect where you had a major polluting event and then legislators acting is what has tended to lead to improvements all around the world, as I'll come back to. It also is important to acknowledge that not all air pollution is human created, although human created is the most important for most places where people live. And in some parts of the world, it is in fact the minority. So volcanoes, dust storms, forest fires and lightning are all examples of highly air polluting events. Uh, and if you take, for example, the last major eruption, the UK is, is uh, fortunate in not having any major active volcanoes, many countries do. The last time a major active volcano erupted in Iceland that the wind blew the uh, fumes in our direction, mainly sulfur dioxide in this case, uh, Lackey, uh, in 1783, it, was, it killed probably around 23,000 people from this volcano alone, mainly from sulfur dioxide. So, Natural events can be highly polluting as well as uh, artificial events. But in most industrial countries, uh, most air pollution is for human made. And therefore, that is what this lecture will obviously concentrate on. Now, air pollution has effects on the lung, fairly obviously. That's what, what the pollutants first hit. But it actually also has, uh, and different pollutants have different effects as we'll go through, much wider effects. But there are, importantly, and I think this is where, again, some of the discourse in the media can get a bit confused, very many different types of pollution which have different effects on the body and different causes and different solutions. And it is important not to try and lump them together. Uh, they are different sets of problems with different ways of addressing them. This lecture uh, will concentrate on uh, a few in part because they're important and in part because they illustrate particular things we need to deal with. I'm going to talk about lead, uh, particulate matter, and I'm going to uh, talk uh, consistently about uh, PM10 and PM2.5. Those are the two most widely known particulates. PM2.5 is much smaller than PM10. Sulfur dioxide, the nitrogen oxides, uh, and ammonia. Now, with all of them, there is a pyramid of effect. A few people, and in some of these cases, many people, will die. A much larger number of people will be sufficiently ill that they end up having to come into hospital or have other major events, right down to people who have some minor effects which may cause them problems if they're repeated over a long period of time. So the deaths, which is what people tend to concentrate on, are just the tip of a very large pyramid. Now, I'm going to give two estimates from the World Health Organization, but I want to put some health warnings around these. These are based on incomplete data, and in my view, there's a little bit of advocacy uh, drifting into some of the data that's produced. But I think they give a ballpark about how important pollution, air pollution is. The World Health Organization estimates that one in nine deaths worldwide are due to air pollution, one in nine. And around three million deaths are attributable solely to ambient, that's to say, outside air pollution. Uh, and of those, actually lung is not the only major issue. Uh, around a third of them are heart disease, and around a third of them are stroke. Lung cancer, uh, chronic obstructive airways disease, which we talked about in the lecture last time around, uh, are, are also major issues. Now, one of the things that bedevils the whole discussion of air pollution is that it is subject to strong advocacy positions on both sides of the argument. And I'm going to do my best to navigate between those, but this remains my own personal opinion on this, uh, and we have to accept there are, in a sense, two uh, sides to this particular argument. And that is because there are genuine trade-offs between economic uh, impacts and air pollution impacts. Basically, as I'll come on to, the great majority of air pollution can be got rid of, provided you're prepared to pay. But there is an economic impact for this. And in least, the least wealthy countries, and within any country, the least wealthy people in society have the biggest negative impact from air pollution, but also tend to feel the negative impacts of the economic impacts also greatest. But the, uh, undoubtedly, the health effects are greater. 
But it is important when we think about how we respond to be aware that that tension exists. So as I say, the talk will concentrate on outdoor ambient air pollution in high-income countries. I will talk at the end a bit about lower-income countries. But I'll concentrate on high-income countries partly because this is in London, but also because the high-income countries demonstrate what is possible, provided you're prepared to spend the money. They demonstrate that air pollution is a technically fixable problem in the great majority of cases. Now, there is actually uh, quite broad support for the role of the state in reducing air pollution across the political spectrum. I've chosen front pages from a range of newspapers which in general do not agree with one another on virtually any, other, any issue. But on this one, there is a broad consensus. And if you talk, listen to politicians, there is also a broad consensus between the political parties that this is an issue that needs to be dealt with. And the reason, you know, within the discussions that we've had over the last uh, four years, I've had the privilege of being here at Gresham College, I've talked a lot about the question, what is the role of the individual and what is the role of the state in managing a health problem? In the case of air pollution, the individual can only have a very small impact on their own risk, and that is their families, particularly outdoor air pollution. They can have some. And the state therefore has to do the heavy lifting if we're going to have major impacts on this. So either the state intervenes or no one is going to intervene is in reality the, the fact, the, the fact uh, with air pollution. Globally, uh, inevitably, the data are best in wealthier countries. And each of these dots is a data point where we know the data reasonably well. And I've chosen, in this case, particulate matter, PM2.5, which is the smaller of these. A green dot means air pollution of PM2.5 is not too bad. Yellow, moderate. Red, you don't want to be there. If you can uh, avoid it, or you, more importantly, you need to get the air pollution uh, back under control. And as you can see, firstly, Wealthier countries have less air pollution globally, and in particular compared to Asia. But large areas of the world, we just don't know how much air pollution there is, although our guess would be quite a lot. So we're, we, in many areas, particularly of Africa, of Latin America, uh, we simply do not have the data. <coughs> so the World Health Organization has to do estimates of what the deaths will be. And uh, this is its rough estimate of how many people die, what proportion of the population die due to air pollution. And as you can see, the biggest burden is actually felt in rapidly industrializing countries, particularly in Asia. So if you want to look at numbers of people who die, that is the biggest group. Now, a few more general points before I go on to the individual pollutants. Most of them are obvious, but I think they need to be uh, restated. The first of which is air pollution depends on exposure. So having high pollution, this is a coal power station, in a very rural area may be much less dangerous to health. It may have environmental impacts, but I'm talking just about the health impacts here, much less dangerous to health than, let us say, an old bus in a very large crowd. So where the pollution occurs is as important as how much pollution there is, uh, because it, it's, it's the combination of the pollution plus the person that causes the problem. The second, and this is a caveat that runs through all of what I'm going to say, is that our degree of certainty about health effects varies by both pollutant and by disease. And I'm not going to go through the details of this. I'm just making this point up front that there are some areas we know a lot about. We have very strong evidence, for example, on lead, on particulate matter, and on sulfur dioxide, and fairly strong evidence on nitrogen oxides, ozone, and ammonia. I'm not going to talk about ozone, but the others, all of the others I'm going to talk about. It's much easier to identify things which are associated with a sudden event. If you find that there is a pollution has a spike, and immediately after it, someone has a stroke, a heart attack, asthma, that's much easier to pick up than subtle, low-grade, low slow-onset things like dementia or potentially cancer. So the data we have are better for some areas of health than others and some pollutants than others. And a lot of the data is highly technical. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to, you'll be pleased to say, to hear, go through page after page of slides like this. Uh, but this is a slide that demonstrates pretty conclusively that myocardial infarction 
heart attack is associated with particulate matter, the PM 2.5 and PM 10. It's also important to stress that mortality is not the only uh, outcome of importance. And let's start off with pregnancy. These are data actually from London. And what they show is that if you, asso you can associate pretty clearly air pollution with mothers having low birth weight children. The more pollution there is, the smaller the size of the baby when it comes out. And most people will be aware that that tends to uh, indicate that they'll have more health problems in early life. There are a variety of confounding factors, but this data are shown repeatedly. And this is the top end here is looking at the nitrogen oxides, and the bottom end here is looking at the particulate matters. The only one where there isn't an association actually is ozone. So the first thing is there is clearly an association. And unsurprisingly, children are more vulnerable to air pollution than adults are because they have developing brains and bodies. There's very good evidence, for example, for an association between lead and brain development of both fetuses and children. I'll come on to lead uh, in a minute. And there's certainly good evidence of an association between lung development in children uh, and air pollutants. And just to uh, give an example, here, these are data from the USA. And what they demonstrate is that the lung function growth of children is absolutely correlated in five different places, but absolutely correlated with how much air pollution they are exposed to. Really clear observational data. And importantly, because if you, association doesn't prove causality, if you reduce the air pollution, the lung function gets better. So this is what's happened to air pollution in these five sites. And what you can see is between the first two readings, there was a slight drop in air pollution, and then a big drop to the third reading. And what you find when you look at the lung function, slight improvement between the first and second, and a big improvement when you get to the third one. So air pollution is associated with lung function. If you get rid of the air pollution, lung function gets better. That's a pretty strong level of causality proof. We can certainly obsess far too much about the exact numbers of deaths and illnesses in air pollution. I think we can say conclusively that the numbers of deaths are large and the numbers of people who do not die but have significant health impacts are large. We have therefore, in my view, and I think most people would agree, sufficient information to act. As a scientist, I spend a lot of my time saying, please don't do something, wait for more data. You may be wrong. In this case, in my view, the data are perfectly strong enough to take action. And I think most people would agree with that. For lead particulates, sulfur dioxide and the NOxes in particular, the evidence is harm is easily good enough now to be confident that reducing them will be beneficial to very many people. Now, that isn't to say we know everything about air pollution. There's still quite a lot we don't know, actually. And I'll highlight two areas that we don't know. The first one is we do not necessarily know is the problem a peak effect that actually you, you only get problems if it exceeds a certain amount or is it a cumulative effect over your lifetime that has the effect? Now, that's important because if it's just a peak effect, then you might, for example, be able to have a policy thing that's, that smoothed out driving in cities, let's say by taxation, if you drove between 9 and 12 or something like that, uh, and actually spread the pollution through the day, and that would improve health. Whereas if it's a cumulative effect, that would have no impact on health because you'd still get the same exposure. So these kind of questions are not just technical. They have some important policy importance. And there's also important questions, for example, about the shape of particulate matter. Some shapes we know cause much more inflammation in the body than others. So just the fact there's air pollution doesn't, may not matter as much as what sort there is. But uh, in a sense, these are at the margins. The key thing is the effects of air pollution are substantial, localized and rapid. This is a study that came out this year in The Lancet, and I've shown it it's because what it shows is what they took was a group of people and they got them to do two hours of walking in Hyde Park and two hours of walking on Oxford Street, which for those who are watching online are just next to one another. And what it showed was that if you walked in Hyde Park, over the next 24 hours in blue, your lung function substantially improved, but if you walked in Oxford Street, it did not. But importantly, it also, if you walked in Hyde Park, your 
uh, the, your, your blood vessels uh, became in, less stiff, and if you walked in, Hyde, in Oxford Street, they became more stiff. That's just a very short exposure, literally half a mile apart. So what this shows is air pollution can be very rapid, significant in several bits of the body, uh, and very localised. So I'm now going to go through several of the key uh, in pollutants because I think it's the, the, by understanding individual pollutants, we can understand the general principles. And the first uh, is lead in petrol. Uh, now largely historical, not completely, unfortunately. Uh, it's an instructive, if extreme, example. Lead has been known to be toxic at high levels for two millennia. This, the fact that lead is dangerous was no news to anybody. Uh, in the 1920s, General Motors uh, in, uh, developed by this gentleman, Thomas uh, Midgley, uh, developed an uh, a engineering solution to a problem which was uh, knocking in uh, car engines if you increase their compression. For the engineers amongst you, uh, this will be old hat. The point about this was that having lead in petrol was one of many potential engineering solutions. Another, for example, was to put in ethyl alcohol, but ethyl alcohol couldn't actually be patented, so it had no major commercial attractions. Uh, at, at that time. So they chose and heavily marketed tetraethyl lead. Now from the beginning, sensible people said this is going to be a disaster. Lead in particular by Alice Hamilton, little known I think outside occupational medicine, but one of the great leaders of occupational medicine, the first woman to get a place on the faculty of Harvard, although because she was a woman they didn't give her tenure, but uh, that's a by the by. Um, and uh, she said, from the beginning, this is going to cause serious toxicity problems. Many other people did. But for three decades, all the research done on the health effects of lead in petrol were done by the industry. And they unsurprisingly came to the conclusion that this was no big problem, and that insofar as there was lead in the environment, it didn't come from petrol. It came from other sources. Over the next, then at that point, a few people started to do independent research and they came up from the 1960s with really clear evidence. It was incremental, but by the end damning, that this had a very big effect on the brains, particularly of fetuses and children. It significantly reduced IQ, intelligence, and there was a pretty convincing link to crime for reasons that are not fully understood. So restrictions began in the 1970s and they, were in, they came little by little and the industry had said, firstly, there's no health effects. And then secondly, when there were health effects, well, the lead's nothing to do with us. This is just in the environment. But when lead was removed from petrol, uh, the average American child's blood level went down from 13.7 to 2. So a very substantial risk. So again, really clear evidence of causality. The UK was a little bit behind uh, the US. Uh, and the final ban on four-star petrol, which may, most of you will remember, uh, actually happened in 1998 quite strong pushback from certain bits of the in, uh, industry, but was being phased down well before that. Uh, and this shows what happened to lead in the atmosphere as the various bits of legislation came in, essentially from a very large amount down to, for practical purposes, nothing at all. Relatively simple anything. What happened? The engineers found other solutions to deal with knocking in cars. There were plenty of alternative engineering solutions to this particular problem. It wasn't that lead was the only way we could do this. It was one solution amongst others. Officially, uh, the world is petrol lead free worldwide uh, as from 2013. Unfortunately, not strictly true. So now on to the pollutants that we do still have. And the UK, again, you wouldn't believe this if you read many of the newspapers, is actually doing pretty well in tackling emissions from many of the main air pollutants. This graph tracks the rates and its rate of change here of the major air pollutants uh, from 1970 up to now. And what you can see is very substantial reductions over that time, particularly in the nitrogen oxides, the particulate matters, and sulfur dioxide. I'll go through each of those because they have slightly different uh, drivers and different effects, much less impact on ammonia. Let's start off with sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide has several health effects. It triggers asthma attacks, and the causality there is very clear. If someone has a tendency to asthma and you put sulfur dioxide, you spray it at them, they will get an asthma attack. The more you give, the bigger the attack will be, and the more likely they are to have an attack if they don't often get asthma. So that's very clear, and it's dose-dependent. It has wider respiratory effects. It's associated fairly clearly with preterm birth. 
is associated in adults with excess mortality and it contributes to particulate matter, which, as we'll come on to, is one of the really more, the most difficult things. So not a good thing. If you look at where it comes from in the UK, the great majority in this light blue is industry. In purple, that's domestic uh, uh, things. And then the uh, orange is other. Uh, transport has a relatively small Im impact on this. Now, it's perfectly possible, in engineering terms, to reduce sulfur dioxide. Uh, and other sulfur oxides of different sorts. And since coal burning is the most common, by some distance, the most common cause of sulfur dioxide, the easiest way to do it is burn less coal. If you do that, the problem goes away incredibly quickly. If you have to burn coal, use sul low, low sulfur coal, because coal varies hugely in how much sulfur it has in it. So uh, lowest sulfur coal is up to 85% less in terms of sulfur dioxide, but it is more expensive. So the reason people use old sulfurous coals is they're cheaper. It's as simple as that. There are, if you're going to use coal, then various methods you can use to remove sulfur dioxide. For example, pump pumping limestone slurry into a jet of sulfur dioxide, the two react together, and that removes most of the sulfur dioxide from the waste gas. This is called scrubbing. And in particular, we can consider low sulfur fuels in transport. The amount that transport contributes to sulfur is actually quite small, but where it does, it does so on, the on you on the pavement next door, or you with the car in front of you. So moving over to low sulfur fuels and there are a variety of industrial processes. So there are many solutions, potentially, to reducing sulfur in the environment. This is not an unfixable problem. And, indeed, we have largely fixed it. This is sulfur dioxide, again, since the 1970s up to now, and there has been a 96% reduction overall in the UK as these various effects have come, in, come, in, come on train. But what you find is sulfur dioxide is very heavily concentrated in urban areas which, of course, is where people live. So it's not a problem that's gone away, but it's a problem that's reduced very substantially. That isn't, of course, true globally. And this is a NASA, rather nice NASA map, uh, looking at one day in 2017. And it makes two points. Sulfur dioxide heavily concentrated in those countries which choose to burn coal as a major part of their energy source. And secondly, it then travels on the trade winds, those are the light colours, so it's not just a problem for you immediately around the power station, it's actually a problem for everyone downwind. So this is an international problem as well as a national problem. Sulfur dioxide, acid rain, also has environmental effects, but that's uh, for another talk, I think. And the other extreme <coughs> is ammonia. Now, ammonia at very high doses, as in anybody who did chemistry at school will know, is highly irritant and can cause, uh, cause you to cough and splutter and can indeed trigger asthma. But other than those who are occupationally exposed, which includes uh, to school teachers, uh, there's no current effort, evidence of substantial effects of prolonged low-grade exposure. So that's quite different from, for example, sulfur dioxide. But it does contribute to particulate matter. So it is something which is indirectly important. Particulates are formed by several chemicals often coming together. And if you look at where ammonia is found, in contrast to sulfur dioxide, a lot of it is found in areas of the world which are relatively wealthy. And if you look at our, our progress in reducing ammonia in the UK, it has been incredibly thin over the, since the 19, uh, this is since 1985. And the great majority of ammonia pollution comes from the agricultural industry, particularly cattle, poultry, and spread on, on uh, the soil. So in, again, in contrast to sulfur dioxide, the high concentrations of ammonia are in areas of heavy farming, the West Country, East Anglia, uh, uh, areas of North Wales, for example, uh, as compared to the industrial areas that you found with sulfur dioxide. A very different pattern. We do need to think quite seriously as a country, I think, about how we reduce this. But the great majority of our concern about air quality and its effect on health is actually in urban areas. And that uh, is unsurprisingly because urban areas is where people live. So if you combine high density of population and air pollution, it's going to have a much bigger effect than having it in a rural environment. These are the areas of particular DEFRA concern, the dark areas, they're the big cities. Here is London. Anywhere uh, with a colour uh, is somewhere which DEFRA has concerns about, the air 
quality now. And so I'm now going to talk about the two pollutants that are particularly associated with urban environments, nitrogen oxides, which are much in the newspapers at the moment, and particulate matters. Let's start off with nitrogen oxides. Uh, nitrogen oxides have come from multiple sources. The green is they come from industry, which has been gradually decreasing, heavy-duty vehicles, uh, but also passenger cars, uh, which had a bit of a spike uh, because of a strong tendency to shift people over to diesel engines, which I think has been widely reported in the newspapers. It occurred earlier, I think, than a lot of people uh, realise. So it comes from very many areas, but the areas that are important in particular, because they come close to humans, are in transport. And if you look at the red areas, where there's a lot of NOxes in the UK, you can see the road network of the UK, particularly the motorways and the urban network, beautifully picked out. That is where you get the really high concentrations. In cities, transport is the biggest uh, impact uh, and um, uh, unsurprising again, uh, even greater in central London than in peripheral London. Uh, in the orange uh, bit of this graph is road transport. So almost half of, road trans of the uh, NOxes in central London will be associated with road transport, although gas, domestic gas does have some contribution as well, so heating uh, in, this, in, this, in the winter in particular. And if you look at where uh, NOxes are in, the, in London, just taking this as a major example, they are concentrated in particular in the really central areas, and anybody who knows where Heathrow is will be able to pick it out here. Uh, and then if you zero in even more deeply, you can see they pick out really beautifully the roads of London. And this is a problem for everybody. This down here is Parliament, Buckingham Palace, the city of London where we are now. This is a problem for rich as well as poor. Now, if you think about the transport mix for NOxes in London, uh, these are slightly old data, but they're still broadly right. Interestingly, this is just, this is just zeroing in on the transport components. Uh, fully 16% are actually due to transport for London buses. So buses really have a substantial part of it. Heavy goods vehicles have a major part and petrol cars Diesel cars are more important in Greater London than in Central London. The point I'm making is different vehicle classes contribute differently, but you need to look at where the problem is. If the problem is in buses, concentrate on buses. If the problem is in diesel cars, concentrate on diesel cars. There has been improvement in particulate matter. So, so, so that's, uh, that's the NOxes. Now we move on to particulate matter. And rather like uh, with the NOxes, they are again heavily concentrated in urban areas. And here, industry, transport, uh, and domestic things all contribute. This is PM10, 10, 10, uh, 10, which is the slightly bigger one. Uh, the same is true for two, PM2.5. Uh, what you see is a significant reduction over time, but nowhere near like sulfur dioxide, for example. So there's still a lot of particulate matter. And this is important because particulates contribute very substantially, we think, to stroke, to heart disease, uh, and very possibly to dementia. So this is a significant problem for society. Now, the good news is emissions from power stations have fallen by about 91% since 1990. But of course, power stations don't tend to be where people live in general, apart from uh, people who particularly like the view of them. Uh, on the other hand, pushing the other way, the, the if you looked back to uh, 1990, 13% of all domestic particulate matter came from wood burning. Now that area has gone up in some areas to 85%. People think of wood burning, and I'll come on to this, in, as a rather sort of cuddly environmental thing. It's not true if you're thinking about uh, pollution. And if you go down to PM1, which is the very small, well, even smaller than PM2.5, uh, residential combustion uh, was associated with a very large proportion, 37%, of which 70% was wood burning. So well, one point I would just like to make, and uh, this is never a popular point, is wood burning stoves are great aesthetically, uh, but uh, they come at less great if you're thinking about particulate matters. So if you think about London, wood burning probably contributes to between 23 and 31% of urban derived 2.5, both here and in Birmingham as another example of a city. And if you want to look at the effect, here is the particulate matter from wood burning uh, in North Kensington uh, during the day in winter. And as you can see, heavily concentrated at the time, someone comes home 
and puts on their beautiful fire, sits down as a meal. But the other major contributor to particulate matters is transport. And that obviously requires a completely different set of uh, interventions. I think people often think of trans particulate matter from transport, they always think about uh, car, car exhaust, and that is important. But articulate matter in transport also comes from brakes. So braking causes significant particulate matter from tires, from what's called resuspension, which is where a car drives along and uh, kicks up dust, uh, which then goes back into the atmosphere, having been down on the ground, and indeed on the tube, where uh, roughly 50% of particulate matter is metal uh, from tubes, uh, from the trains braking and accelerating. So particulate matter isn't just about exhaust. And the reason I make that point is, even if you got rid of the internal combustion engine as a source, you're not going to get rid of these. So they need alternative policy solutions. Now, if you think about the transport mix for emissions of PM2 in uh, London, uh, it's actually quite widely mixed, but taxis, vans, diesel cars contribute quite significant amounts. Because it's across a lot of different car types, you can't just say, well, if we just do it on that, we're going to have a big impact on pollution. So you need to do something which is going to have an impact on multiple different transport modalities. So the best way to do this from the point of view of government is to spur on engineering innovation. And tightening regulations actually works. The evidence for this is really clear, but it only works if manufacturers do not cheat. As anyone knows, again, who's read the newspapers recently, some innovations are effective all the time, some get less effective with time. And what I wanted to do was just look at what has happened to the emissions of particulate matters and NOxes as the European, the EU regulations, which govern European cars, have got steadily tighter. And they've gone down from a situation where particulate matter was not regulated back in 1991. And uh, the NOxes were over 1,000. If you were over, if you were, provided you were below 1,000, you were fine. Down to one where you can be no more than 60 or 80 in the most recent uh, manifestation. And the particulate matter has to be down to five. And every time there's been a step down, industry has responded with engineering solutions to achieve this. Sometimes they've, been, they've gained the system. But as that's happened, we've got rather more uh, clever ways of testing it. And if you look uh, at the various areas, this, for example, is Euro 5, the last version. This is NOx emissions, and this is speed. And as you can see, the old Euro 5 thing, and it old is just the last version, had significant amounts of NOxes with heavy vehicles if they were at low speeds. But the most recent one, under realistic conditions, you find much lower rates. So if you say to engineers, and you give them a enough lead time, you've got to do this, otherwise you can't sell your vehicles, the industry will respond. You have to do it at the right speed, but that is, it is possible. So we need to concentrate on improving standards. We need to think seriously about taxis, public transport, because a lot of them, a lot of the particulates come from them. We need to think about delivery vans, the heavy goods vehicles that come from this, diesel cars. And then we also need to think, can we find some areas which have got high pollution and lots of people and say, look, well, you simply cannot put polluting vehicles into them. And this is the idea of low emission and then more recently ultra low emission zones uh, in centres of towns. You see those maps that DEFRA showed, you find the red and yellow areas and say polluting cars cannot drive in these areas because it is too dangerous for human health. If you do that, you can make a very big inroad on the problem. And then there are, of course, some much bigger uh, solutions. Electric vehicles. If we project forward 50 years, uh, my view is the internal combustion engine, at least in urban transport, will no longer exist. It may still be important for certain long distance transport, uh, potentially for flying. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt the market is growing for electric cars. This is not the kind of wish list of some crazed environmentalist. These are the data from OPEC, and their job is to pump oil. Uh, and this is their f the change in their forecast uh, from, uh, of what electric vehicle percentage will be between 2015 and 2040. This is their 2015 fo uh, forecast, and this is their 2016 forecast. If OPEC think that, this, that batteries is the future, then I think we can be pretty confident batteries are the future. But 
there are some major limitations. Uh, battery technology is still progressing very fast, but we're not yet at the stage where it is as economic as internal combustion engines driven by uh, petrol or diesel. We need to get the charging infrastructure. If, you have, uh, if, we had, if we immediately turned every car, every taxi in London onto electric tomorrow, we would not have the charging ports to be able to do it, so that needs to be built. The grid capacity is currently not sufficient for everybody to start charging at the same time of day. Perfectly possible to engineer it to be sufficient, but we, again, it requires planning, it requires forward looking. Uh, we need regulation to get better. Battery, people think of batteries as entirely safe. Actually, batteries can explode, batteries can catch fire just as much as anything else. There needs to be safety built into them. They are very, very densely packed energy. If you've packed energy densely, it can go bang, as petrol can go bang, as many other things can. And of course, consumer demand is important. There are people who, for reasons best known to themselves, like driving things uh, as they accelerate, uh, and uh, you may have to engineer that in, and so on. So there are a variety of things that we're going to have to deal with, but these are not insuperable barriers. This is a perfectly possible uh, solution. Hydrogen fuel cells, uh, currently a niche product, but there's now actually renewed interest in this uh, over the last two or three years. Um, uh, there is already a projected increase in global uh, hydrogen fuel uh, cell electric vehicles. At the moment, you can only use them for people who do circular trips because there aren't many pumps for hydrogen things. So if they go, they start and, and end in the same place, you can use them. But it's more difficult for someone to go along on a motorway. But that's an infrastructure problem. It's not an engineering problem specifically. Uh, and the UK is particularly well suited to this because we have a gas network which is well suited or can be adapted quite quickly to transferring the whole gas network to hydrogen in a way that few other countries have got. So we should look, I think, very seriously at hydrogen uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, absolutely should not forget, uh, and very important for public health for completely different reasons, active transport. Here, for example, is cycling. People think of cycling as something which is new and trendy. These are, these are the cycling rates uh, that were uh, present up to uh, the 1970s. Really massive numbers of person uh, miles were done by bike. Then everyone bought a car uh, and the situation changed. But actually in urban environments, uh, almost all of the forms of transport are getting less common. These are cars and taxis in the city of London, for example. And if you look at rate of change, this line here is number of miles done by cycle in the city of London uh, between uh, uh, 1999 and 2017. A massive 292% increase in cycling. There's absolutely no reason that could not be extended both in the city of London and elsewhere. And clearly that has very major uh, effects, positive on the environment more generally, and also very good effects on people's health, particularly their cardiovascular health. So this is something which we should uh, celebrate and support. And if you plant trees, uh, another popular thing to do, um, uh, they also absorb pollution. So uh, if you look, uh, this is, uh, these are data uh, looking at PM 2.5 and sulfur dioxide, NOxes uh, and ozone. Uh, so this is, if you look uh, at the actual amount um, of effect of this, uh, trees absorb very large amounts of pollution everywhere. But the health effects of planting trees and the pollution they absorb are particularly important for the particulate matters. So the ONS, the Office for National Statistics here, estimated that in 2015, uh, the, the natural reduction due to planting trees or, or to plants in general was about uh, six, just under 6,000 fewer respiratory hospital admissions due to their absorption of pollutions. Uh, and 27,000 fewer life years lost, and 1.9 uh, uh, thousand fewer premature deaths. These are non-trivial improvements. So trees, good, uh, for practical as well as aesthetic reasons. Now, again, throughout this lecture series, I've, wanted to, I've tried to talk about the ladder of state intervention. What is it reasonable for us to do uh, and what can the state uh, be, the citizen uh, allow the, the state to do and what can the citizen object to? And the ladder starts with leaving things up to the individual, informing individuals, engaging with industry, mass voluntary programs. Each one of these is a bit more, uh, a bit more extreme. 
The reality is that most interventions that have had an impact on air pollution have been to the top end of this ladder. Just informing individuals that they should pollute less has no impact at all. Engaging with industry is fine, but they'll all say, well, that's fine, but if you, can't, if you don't make a level playing field between me and my competitors, then all you're doing is you're making me take a loss. So actually legislation, like the Euro regulations that make a level playing field, allow industry then to do its bit in terms of improving things. So the point I've made throughout this is that reducing air pollution is perfectly possible, largely through engineering means, without crashing the economy. And in high-income countries, we've already gone a very, very long way, and we could go considerably further with current technology, and we'll go further still as technology improves. Uh, and if you just think about what's been achieved since 1990, a 71% reduction in the NOxes, a 95% reduction in sulfur dioxide, uh, and over 50% reduction in PM2.5. These are non-trivial improvements. I'm not saying they couldn't be improved further, but we've done a lot. Of course, it's much more difficult in countries which are rapidly industrialising, as the UK had rapidly industrialised, um, and the substantial variation between cities. Uh, Beijing, for example, has, which is, so this is London. Uh, London, uh, compared to London, Beijing has roughly uh, five times more particulates, and Delhi has roughly ten times more particulates than a London on the streets. So poorer countries, industrialising countries, recently rich countries have much greater levels of pollution than the ones which have had time for their engineering systems to adapt. And of course, within any city, London included, there's very, very great variation, just not just in space, but also in time. This, for example, is the amount of pollution uh, in Be Beijing uh, and uh, its air quality index. Anything in uh, dark brown is severely polluted. Each one of these is a day of the year. Anything in uh, red uh, is moderately polluted or in purple heavily polluted. And what you can say is there are a few days of the year when pollution's fine. There are many idea, days of the year when pollution's not fine but not catastrophic and there are some where it is very bad indeed. And I think, again, anyone who reads the newspapers will know that. This will be true for any city which has got a significant pollution problem. There will be day-to-day -day variations and some of those days will be very bad indeed. If you have asthma, for example, if you have heart disease, those days are going to be problematic. So my general final point, reducing air pollution substantially is technically possible and essential for health, but it is not cost-free. This uh, is one of Turner's great paintings of the Thames above Waterloo Bridge. This is what a rapidly industrialising city looks like. We have gone through this phase ourselves. There's no city in the world which has not gone through this phase uh, at some point. And at that point, the level of pollution in London was probably substantially greater than we find in Beijing or in, uh, in Delhi today. For many pollutants, we've made substantial progress already. Uh, for NOxes, there's an en there is an engineering solution because we can basically get rid of the internal combustion engine, and that will take NOxes that are near people down to much lower levels than they are. Particulates are harder because they come from so many different sources, some of which are things like tyres, some of which are other chemicals combining, but they are still uh, possible to reduce and the health impacts of particulates are substantial. As I showed uh, in some of the earlier slides, this is an international problem. It's a problem everywhere. It's particularly a problem in rapidly industrializing countries. But if, you if, you're in a city, if you're in a city that has good pollution and you live next to, door to and downwind of a city with bad pollution, you're going to catch some of the problems. Some of our pollution comes from Europe, some of their pollution comes from us uh, on, on the wind, and that's true around the world. So it's an international problem. There are real trade-offs between rapid industrialization and pollution, but I would make the point really clearly that the poorest are always the ones who suffer most from very, very bad pollution. If you're wealthy in a polluted country, you go and live in a place where there's less pollution. Always been true, it always will be true. The poorest are left in the places with the heavy pollution, they are the ones on whom the burden will fall. And so I think when thinking about the economic trade-offs, we have to bear that firmly in mind. Thank you very much.